That could be. And that would make you that could. plus six, so you would be 18. Yeah, that's... Yeah. And then, so... For that. Okay, we are starting a new book, Komish Bamidbar. Woo! We're opening up, literally, literally, we're opening up, opening up a new page. It's a new book. It's a new beginning. It's a new start. Um, and you know, so funny because, like, in my in the rabbit hole that I fell into yesterday or this morning of like, rat, you know, how you do the rabbit hole of like, saw one thing on YouTube and then you ended up someplace else. So. <laughs> Maybe I'm the only one who does that. Um, so I there was a there there was a little clip of a teacher who does an affirmation with her class every single day, and she's like, "Today's a new day, and it's a new beginning, and you can make a difference." You know, what are you going to do today? I'm, I'm asking she didn't like better and whatever, but like, what are you doing today to make the world a better place? And basically, what she's doing is she wants to teach the kids all these things that she wished she would have known. You know, she's I'm not here. I'm not. I'm not teaching test takers. I'm teaching human beings, and 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 here we are. So Chumash Midbar. So that was my rabbit hole, and I was like, oh, that that was a nice little segue. It was very cute. Um, and here's Chumash Midbar, and we are starting a new book. Now, uh, what's the English name for Chumash Midbar? Numbers, numbers, right? Meaning Midbar literally means in the desert, right? A midbar is a desert, but midbar means in the desert. The English name is, is numbers. So we ask ourselves, as we often ask ourselves with these things, how do you get the name? And in the, in the Gemara, and the Chazal talk about Chumash, Chumash Bamidbar, and they call it Chumash Hapikudim or Sefer Hapikudim, the book of counting. It opens up with a census, and, excuse me, and it closes with the census. And isn't it so cute, maybe cute isn't the word, that we always read Chumash Bamidbar during Sphira. When we're when we're counting. So it's like, we're going to say, yes, it's cute, but it's obviously going to be something a little bit more than just that. So we're going to touch on that a little bit. Um, and so, so that's one thing that I want to say. Now, before we get into our Parsha, I wanted to say a preface about the book. Because if I was going to give a subtitle to the name of the book, um, Bamidbar literally is supposed to cover the 40 years that the Jews are. Two years, and then it has the last year and a half, two years. So if I was to subtitle the book, it would be Jews in Transition. The book is Jews in Transition. What happens to us when we are in transition? And anybody who deals with children knows, just close enough mind, knows that transition is a very hard place to be. You know, we, you know, when you take a kid to the park, you always have to tell them we're leaving in five minutes. I mean, they don't know how to tell time. So five minutes is like, a kind of, you know, it's kind of a flux space, but you can never say we're leaving right now. You always have to give that place because that place of transition is very, very hard. And when we look at what happens to the Jews in this space, and we have to a little bit have uh, have that in mind, like that place of being in transition is not an easy place to be. Okay, so so here we are. Open if you're opening up Chumash Bamidbar, Parakal of Pasakal. There's there's a couple of themes that are going on in this parsha. First thing that we're going to have is we're going to have a, an introduction that Hashem speaks to Moshe in the mid in Midbar Sinai. In the Olmoid, on the first day of the, on the first day of the second month, in the second year for the Jews leaving Egypt. No, Per Chumash Bamidbar. We're starting a new one. We're starting a new book. We're opening a new page. Okay. So the first thing we're going to hear is that we are going to. This is happening on the first day of the second month, which is the second month. Which is the year is the second month, right? Nisan, according to Jewish, the Jewish count, uh, Nisan's month, we know that the Torah does not give numbers to the months. So the first month is Nisan, the second month is Iyar, first day of Iyar, and the second year that the Jews are in the desert. Shem says to him, Su'u Esrosh Kaladas Bene Israel, lift up to their. Father's house. We're going to count to the people. Now, if we were going to back up for a second, what, what's going on in the desert now? What happened till now? What happened? Got out of Egypt. Got out of Egypt. Got yeah. got to the desert. Mm -hmm. didn't have any water. Give me, give me, give me cliff notes. What happened? Yeah. Got the Torah. Got the Torah. Got the Torah. And then what happens after the Torah? 
Yes, and what's the massive thing that happens after Revelation? What? Chet Egel, right? We have the Chet Egel, we have the sin with the golden calf, we have the whole situation over there, we have the building of the Mishkan, remember? So that's the whole first year. So on the first day of the first month of the second year, the first day of Nisan of the second year, which is 2449 in creation years, the Mishkan is set up. Finally, yay, blah, blah, blah. Now a month later, they're going to they're gonna have the census that's going to happen. Um, that they're, they're, We're going to have the census that's going on now. Now for a second, I just want to back up for a second. What's the plan now? Not what do we know happens, but what's the plan right now? For the sec- first day of the second month of the second year that the Jews are in the desert, what is their game plan for the next little while? Okay, okay. so you're, mix- you're mixing pieces. Oh. No, no, it's good. You're mixing pieces. But what was the original plan after they got the Torah? Go to Israel. Go to Israel. So if we have to go to Israel and we're going to have to fight to get the land, what's the thing that you first need to do? Okay. You need to know how many people you have to fight. You need to know what your count is. You need to know what the situation is. We're going from here to the land of Israel. Now, they have not yet had the sin with the spies. So they haven't yet had a decree that they're going to be in the desert for 40 years. So right now, our Chumash opens up full of hope, full of moving forward. And we're going to start with getting a count. How many people we need to go conquer the land of Israel? How many fighters do we have? Okay, and the Pesach Gimel says, from 20 years and up, whoever goes to the army, whoever goes to fight, we're going to count them and we're going to place them, you and Aaron. Now, if anybody's ever been a part of a census, which I have been, um, one of the things that's very interesting about the Jewish census is that it's, you know, for sure in America, it happened in Israel. Also, when I was part of a census, it was actually very interesting. Somebody came to my hands, the computer answered my question, right? But um, you, you don't take the busiest people in the, in the house to do the census, right? You take, like, the people who, sure, want a job, go to be a census counter. Like, you know, it's not the most, it's not the most, excuse me, of the United States to co- go around the and so what happens here is that Moshe is going to do a camp and they're going to do a census, um, which is going to give us a little bit of an insight into what's happening with the census besides actually getting a number. And the other thing that's very interesting is that this is the first time we've had numbers of the Jewish people before, right? When the Jews leave Egypt, we are told that they were 600,000 men, blah, blah, blah. The Torah just gives us a number, right? Hashem did the internal census and gave us a number. This is the first time as we're starting to head into the land of Israel, where we're going to be placed, not just in the context of we, the Jewish people, but we, a tribe, we, our father's home. Like, where do we fit in to not just this, but like, where do I individually fit in? Which is, you talk about a census, where you talk about counting, right? Everybody's just a number. We don't say, oh, you get like 10 points and you get like, you know, whatever. It doesn't, we don't say, everybody's a one. You're a one, you're a one, you're a one, you're a one. Everybody's a one. Everybody gets one point in the census. And there's some places where it's really a great equalizer. The end of last week's parsha, which we didn't end up doing, there was something called Erchin, where you could give the value of a person to, to Tashem. And one of the ways that we do a value, we give the, the, the valuation. Yeah. One way we give the valuation is just age and sex. Males between the ages of this, females between the age of this. This is what their that's this is what their their erich is. This is what their value is as a just a general thing. But there's also something if somebody wants to give a more it's it's a more specific kind. Somebody who you know I once remember reading about a piano player whose hands were were insured, right? Because that was their everything, right? Anything happened to their hands, they were they were totally messed over, and there there was a way you could give the personal value of a person, Tashem also. This census doesn't care about your personal value. It just cares about you as part of the Jewish people, but specifically not just a blob of a number, but you as you fit into, uh, how do you fit into Kal Yisrael? Where, does you, where, do you, where do you fit into the pieces? Okay, so the first thing that Torah is gonna tell us is that we're going to, it's gonna list the names of the heads of tribes that count, the, that are gonna do the census with Moshe and Aaron, 
personally, by the way, I'm actually starting to get cold if anybody's freezing, that we could raise the number. I don't know what it is at now, but if it's at 23, it'll be very nice in here and they'll still be able to use it in the other room. I wouldn't turn it off because I think they're still using it. The air, the air conditioning wars are starting, Baruch Hashem. Okay, so, so, we're gonna, so here we're going to start through. We have the who's going to count, and we start counting the people from 20 and up. Now, the second aliyah is, if you're following with me, the second aliyah is really just the numbers. It's going to say, we'll do one. Okay, so yeah, 20 is, it gets very cold there. 23 should be nice. Okay, so let's do one number, and we're not going to go through all of them. If anybody's super math people, then they're going to love it. I'm not a super math person, so we're going to just do one of them and say, and this is what happens for everybody else. So, uh, chapter one, verse 20. Okay, the second Aliyah. Okay, so we have the, uh, who wants to read? Give it to me in English, doesn't matter. You start, you got it? You need to read a little bit louder because I can't hear you. Yeah. The sons of Ruby, um, According to the number of individual names, every male who is one years old and above, all who are 15 years old. Keep going. Oh, there's Tali from the tribe of Ruby, 46,500. We're not going to continue doing all the numbers. Okay, 46,500. Now, if you wanted to practice your Hebrew, if you looked at it in the Hebrew, you would see that the Hebrew numbers are backwards. No, Shisha Va'arba'im Elif, which is 46,500. Exactly, six and 40,000. No, in English, we don't say that. No, yes, we do. We're four and 20,000 people? Yeah, like old fashioned. Okay, old fashioned, fine. Okay. Four score and 20 years. It's a weird way to say but this is but this is actually in Hebrew, they give numbers in Hebrew. And whenever you like, so now, so what's going to happen now is that the Torah is going to give a solid two long um, sukkim per tribe. And it's going to give you how many people were in every single tribe, which sabah, but we hear that we need to know what the number is. Okay. That's going to go all through, through the second aliyah. Now what's going to happen kind of interesting, then the next thing they're going to do um, in verse 44, we're going to have, uh, these are, then it's going to give us a total number of everybody. Okay. Um, these are the numbers that Moshe and Aaron and the tribes, call, uh, the tribes of Israel counted. Ish, ish, lebeis, lebeis, and, you. and then it's going to give us a total. Now, I want to say something very interesting about the numbers. Every single number that is listed in the Torah is going to end up being a full number. You never have a tribe that has like 573 people, right? And so, so Chazal said they did not round it, but that Hashem worked it. And just think how many generations of chess playing that is to make sure that when we do the count everything's going to be in full numbers now the part of us is like oh, i probably just rounded it all up but but the chazal said that they did not round it and that there was all this intent to make sure that it was so perfect now none of these numbers even though they're big numbers citizens they're you know five number you know five five digit numbers and maybe six digit numbers none of them are very complicated numbers so for the torah to then give us a total of all the numbers it's like this is kind of basic math right we don't but okay but but my kid the torah wants to give us the the total number fine we're going to run with that um and we're, we find out that the total in plus and above the total number of people that we have of men 20 and over is how many uh, noah in uh, 603,550 which if you actually know how many letters there are in a safe torah that is how many letters there are in a Torah scroll. Huh? 603,550 is the exact number of letters that we have in a Torah scroll. Okay? This, what, this is the total count of the men 20 and over. So it's not the total count of the people because you don't have the women, you don't have the men younger, you don't have the, we don't actually, it's not so clear at what point they stop the census. There's, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, there's not, it's not clear how, at what point they stop the census. There are other places we talk about 20 to 60 being a number, um, but it's here it does just 20 and over. Okay. And here we have in Pasuk Mem Zion, Vahalavim Lemata Votam, Lo Hitpaktu Betocham. And the, the Levites were not counted with all these people. Now, if anybody's paying attention, 
which we kind of glossed over, so we didn't totally pay attention. When we counted, A, when we listed the heads of tribes who were going to be part of it, Levi didn't have a head of tribe there. We had Menashe and Ephraim, we, so we had 12 tribes, but Levi wasn't part of it. And when we gave you all the numbers of all the tribes, Levi wasn't part of it, right? And so all of a sudden, Hashem coming and saying, and the Levim were not counted, makes us say, huh? Like, we kind of figured that one out. What are you telling us? And then Hashem says to Moshe in the next Pasuk, they were not counted. Tribal lady was not counted. Their, head, their heads were not lifted up amongst the B'nai Israel, and now count the Levim, okay? Um, for, for their service in the, in the Mishkan and what they're going to do, blah, blah, blah. So some of the commentators talk about, uh, and specifically the Bali Musa talk about the idea that there is a place, Moshe is from the tribe of Levi. Hashem gives him this count to, no, Hashem gives him this command to count the Jewish people. And his tribe is not included. And in the, in the moment, he doesn't say like, uh, God, um, did you forget about us? He doesn't say that. Hashem gives him a command and he does what Hashem says. Once that job is done, he opened the conversation and he said, what about us? However, Moshe said, he probably wasn't like, you know, he probably didn't speak like that. And at that point, Hashem says, that the tribe of Levi is not counted, they're gonna be counted separately. And it's very, I think, I think it's kind of important for us as a, as a lesson to think about for a second. There are times that we need to do a job and there, we have questions about the bigger picture and it's okay to have questions, but sometimes the questions have to wait until I do what I need to do. And then I'm gonna, then I'm gonna run with my questions. Moshe's place at the time, when Hashem says, go count the Jewish people, it was not to say, uh, did you forget about the Levites? Like, Obviously, he's disturbed by it. That's my, maybe he wasn't disturbed by it. I don't know, maybe he had total insight and he wasn't disturbed. But when we sometimes see something, we're like, what about us? Where's our part in that? And we could easily say, you know, that's not so good. And don't stop and ask the questions now. Now there's something that has to happen. Let's do what has to happen. You'll get your answers. You'll, there's absolutely a place for questions in Judaism. There's absolutely a place for what's going on. Um, and, and, but right now, when the when you have a job to do, you actually have to step up to the plate and do the job. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. They have the levy. Okay. So the next thing that we have over here is still part of still part of the second aliyah, but not like towards the end of it. We have that the Levites are going to be given the charge of taking care of the Mishkan. They're going to be given the charge of taking care of the of taking care of the the tabernacle when they travel. They had to take down the walls. They had to put the things together. They had to carry the pieces from point A to point B. Okay, so that's kind of there. That's like a, a couple of circum over there, but we're going to get into it later again. And then the next thing that we're going to have is the camp of the Jewish people. Okay, we're going to spend the whole of the third aliyah discussing the camp of the Jewish people. So for a second, anybody who's following along, I'm going to be at the board. I'm totally not going to look at so work with me over here. Okay. We know that the Mishkan is, it lies west-east. It's not a north-south structure, it's a west-east, okay? So the first thing we're going to find out is that the Levites are going to camp all around the Mishkan. Fun fact is that there is there what's called a Tchum Shabbos. How far am I, is a person allowed to walk on Shabbos? Between every single camp. That means God is by himself. There's nobody, no, in order to get to, in order to get to the Mishkan, you have have to, you couldn't come from an angle because there's a certain amount that you're allowed to walk on Shabbos in an uninhabited space. And it was just under that from Shabbos if you came from the right angle. If you came from, if you came from, a, if you came from an angle, it was too far. But if you came this way, like so the air, no, no, an air, an air of makes it possible makes to, it like a no, it makes it a pass, makes no, so no, it has nothing to do with an air. The, uh, right, that's a, huh? there's no air at all. Well, the point of the air is to make something a private property. And the point of Tukum Shabbos is an uninhabited space. If I want to go walking in the desert, I want to go walking where there are no houses. As long as there are houses, it's considered inhabited. So Tukum Shabbos doesn't kick in till the last house at the end of the village. Does Tukum Shabbos have the same rules as, as you know, a roof? Like, are you allowed to carry things inside my house? No, you're not allowed to. You're not allowed to. It's, 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 it's not carry your shoes in the back. You can't carry shoes in a bag. Correct. No, but no, but you, you personally, you can't decide to go hiking in an uninhabited desert on Shabbos 
for beyond the Tchum Shabbos. Tchum Shabbos. I, yeah. So what, what is that? Adama is about 18 inches. How far? How big is it? It's under a mile. But like there's a certain amount that you're allowed to walk uh, where it's uninhabited. And so the Mishkan is here in the middle. I mean, yes, question. Um, just like um, between tents, between tents, it's still all the campsite. It's still all the Israelites' campsite. We're not talking about it. We're talking about natural Mishkan. We're starting from the Mishkan. The Mishkan was far away. The Mishkan was in the center. From the Mishkan to the next camp was just under Tchum Shabbos. That means you could come to the Mishkan on Shabbos, but only. But why is that space between the Mishkan and the tent considered Tchum Shabbos? Because like, it's still like one. It, it's, it's not like, inhabited. It's not inhabited. Like, the question is past. No, it's not. Past the last tent where there's no, you know, no man's. That's Tchum Shabbos. It is no. It is. It is no man's land. It is absolutely. If you would, if you were to take a drone on top of the camp, no, because it looks far. It's very far. It's it's like a th- you it's can't one see a, a mile away. Well, it depends how clear and how straight. Whatever. In the desert, I'm saying like if you were to take an aerial view of it, you have the mission in the middle, and then there'd be empty space, very very empty space. There were no neighbors. God has no neighbors. You know, Hashem lives by himself. He has no neighbors. The Levian, who were the next closest people, were not past the Tchum Shabbos because they wouldn't be able to walk, but they were just under. So if you were to come from this way, you could come in, but you couldn't actually come to the Mishkan from this way. You could only get into the Mishkan. And come in this way. So over here we have Moshe and Aaron. Moshe and Aaron and their children live over here. Okay, this pen does not look good. Yes. I'm so sorry, this is going to be annoying. No. What's the definition of Tchum Shabbos? Tchum Shabbos is the, is the distance of Shabbos. The Tchum is a boundary. The boundary of Shabbos is, so the, the, the Chacham would say that there's a certain amount that you just can't go, it's just kind of like not in the spirit of Shabbos to just keep, you know, rambling on and on and on with in, in uninhabited territory. But the places of carrying has nothing to do with that. It has to do with how much you can actually physically walk. Question. So if, like, the last sheep that was before this, they could go to the They could. They could, because all of this is inhabited. As long as there's habitation, it doesn't matter. The question is, in this direction, away from the last tribe, or in this direction, where there's no houses, that's where we start our counting with children. Okay, so we have motion on over here. Um, uh, I don't, I, I think Gershon is, I don't know who's here. We have Gershon, Kafasta, I think they were here. We're going to change it if I'm wrong. We have the three sons of Levi, each get aside. I'm going to write it here, but if somebody's going to check me, they'll see that I might be wrong. I think Gershon, I think this is where it was. Okay, so now, this is the, this is called the Machina Shina. It could. If you said different, then you tell me who's give you the give me. I told you I, I was guessing. Gershon's opposite. Okay. Yeah, I told somebody to check. Thank you, Gershon. And yeah. Marori's on the top. Yeah. And then Gary and then the is at the bottom. Okay. This marker doesn't work, or it doesn't work for me personally. Why are there the names Gershon and not the there are lots of biblical names that have thankfully not transferred over. Yeah, for sure. There are just some, there are a lot of weird names in, in Tanakh. People do the weird names in the Well, also remember Merari's cousin, but who would have bitter? So it's like Miriam, whatever. I don't know. I don't know. I know, I know people called, I knew, I knew somebody called Kaha. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now, so this is Mahashina. I put them closer than they really are. This is Mach and Olivia. The Levites live over here. Moshe and Aaron are Shabbos. So if you want to come to the, to the mission on Shabbos, you need to go past Moshe and Aaron over here. Okay. Beyond them, we have what's called Mach and Yisrael, the camp of the Israelites. And what you're going to have is over here, each camp is going to have a flag. Yes, I failed. Oh, okay. So be each, there's a whole conversation about the flags that they have. Did each tribe have their flag? Were there only four flags? But basically, we have three tribes to each side. So over here, we're going to have the camp of Yehuda. Who was with Yehuda? Sacher and Zebulun. 
We're in the third aliyah. We're in the third aliyah. Okay. <laughs> okay, down at the bottom, we're going to have the camp of Reuven. And with Reuven, we're going to have Shimon. We're not going to have Lady because Lady is over here. Who's our third person with Reuven? Over here, we're going to have the camp of Menasha. And with Menasha, is going to be Ephraim. And guess who's with them? Binyamin. Binyamin. Okay? And at the top, we're going to have the camp of Don. And with Don, it's not Polly and Asher. What do we see? A couple of things I want to say. First of all, the camp end to end was a big square. I am not proportionate over here. Okay. Um, it was 12 mil wide, which is about 12 kilometers wide. Okay. It's a big, big camp. So one of the conversations of having the, having the flags was actually like station identification. Have you ever gone on a trip with your parents? And they say, in case you get lost, meet me at this space. Okay, thank you a lot. <laughs> so they're the flags are very big, very big flags. So if a kid gets lost, they know where they get, where they're going to come back to. It's easy to identify their place. That's one thing. There's a whole conversation. Did each, did each um, tribe have their own flag? It, it, the jury's out. I don't know what the answer is. The flags were the color of their stones on the breastplate. And um, the other thing that we see, if you take a look at the thing, we find like this. These are all the children of Rachel, right? Here we have the children of Leah. No, sorry. Children of Leah are over here. God, Dan, and Asher are the children of the maidservants. Okay, so there's, there's like kind of order going on. And what's very, very interesting about this whole situation is that God is very, very, very invested in this camp. And the question is, why? Like, it's a funny, like, okay, I get things need to be orderly and things need, you know, you need a seder and you need to know where things are and all mitzvahs are like, you got to have a space and you got to know how you're doing it and blah, blah, blah. But really, what's going on over here with this camp? So Rashi brings a couple of things. First of all, he says, Rashi brings that when Yaakov was, when Yaakov passed away in, in Egypt and he was taken up to is to, to Canaan to be buried, he decided, he told everybody how they should carry his coffin. And this was how they did it. He said, Yosef doesn't carry because he's, because he's, a, he's a king. A lady doesn't carry because he's going to work for God. And then ya and, and Yaakov said, you guys, you guys go here, you guys go there, you guys go there, you guys, you guys go there. Um, the, that's one thing that Rashi talks about. The, I think the Shalah brings, and it's very interesting, but I could be wrong, it's not, it might not be the Shalah. One thing that the Torah brings is that when it counts each, um, each degel, each flag, each camp, it gives us the numbers again. It tells us that Yehuda had this many people, and Ruben had Yehuda, and Yisachar, and Zerul, and each had this number, and their total is this, which we just did an aliyah ago. Sorry. Rashi said that the way that they carried Yaakov. Yaakov. Rashi Yaakov. brought up that, that they the can carry they Yaakov's can, body, bones, body, body was this. this camp was this setup was this setup. Okay. Now the other thing that it's brought is that, and we're like around the corner from Shavuos, um, that we know that when Hashem comes, when at Sinai, when we have revelation, Hashem came down with, with hosts of angels, hosts of angels, right? He came down. Gabriel and Michael and all the angels come, they come. And when the Jewish people saw that, they're like, oh, we, want that. we would love to have such a, such a, could we, what, what does it mean Hashem comes with a host of angels? That they are the chariot Hashem. They are the, the way Hashem is manifest in the world. And when the Jewish people saw that revelation, they're like, we would love to have that opportunity. We would love to be God's chariot. And so they set themselves up as the angels came with God down for down for, for revelation. Rashi doesn't, Rashi doesn't say it. No, I think the Shalom said it. And the numbers of the angels 
in each camp, how many camp, how many angels are in the camp of Michael, how many came, came, angels are in the camp of Gabriel, exactly match the numbers of the totals of each tribe as they are here. I don't, I didn't, I didn't, I, I, I didn't, I don't have the numbers of who's on which side, what, which angel is on which side, I forgot to, it's, the, well, it, they bring it, it's not so much in the Medrash, it's bringing it's like, they bring it more in Kabbalah and different kind of like, it's not from the Medrash. Yeah. Um, and I think the Shala also brings it, and he also does a lot of Kabbalah stuff. So I don't remember, I don't, I don't have it written down which angel was referred, was to which side, but they said that exactly those numbers that, that we have is, are the, are the numbers of angels. There's an alternate thought, there's an alternate thought that we know how many angels there were because we know how many Jews there were. If we talk about it and, and the Zohar brings that Hashem looks into the Torah and creates the world, then the world is the blueprint for Hashem. So by knowing how many Jews were in each camp, we then know how many angels were in that corresponding camp. So two ways to look at the, the same situation. Either way, the Jewish people are saying, we want to be, we want to carry God. We want to be the representatives for God in this world. And Hashem says, Yala, go for it. You can do that. Okay. The next thing that we're going to have after, um, after this Aliyah, the fourth Aliyah is going to talk about the genealogy of the tribe of Levi. Because remember, the tribe of Levi has not yet been counted. Okay. And uh, so it's family blah 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 and then it does then it does uh does a census of the tribe of Levi if the Jewish people were counted from 20 years and up the Levites are counted from 30 days and up okay and what's a very interesting thing that we're going to find is that even though we're counting so many more Levites because we're counting them from a month up we're at Hamishi we're at chapter 3 verse 14 um 14 15 16 that's where we are now uh, even though the Levites are going to be counted from a month up, they're still going to have the smallest tribe. Okay. And the, and, and Rashi, Rashi brings in the Medrash, you know, correlates because they did not serve in Egypt. They do not have the bracha of, of the children that the Jewish people had. If there was a bracha given to the Jewish people that as you are afflicted, so you will multiply. They were not afflicted. The tribe of lady never, never did servitude. And so therefore they don't have the, the bracha of the of the malanjevi. What was it? The bracha of fertility. What? I don't know what. Not continuity. It's like there was a specific, maybe legacy, but like lots of kids. Whatever a good word for that would be. So they don't have. So they're going to be the smallest number. Now, so now we're going to have the count. Then the next thing we're going to talk about is, uh, is okay. Now here's an interesting thing. The Levites are counted from a month old. And it tells us right after this, this we're going to count them, what their job is going to be. That the job of the Levites is going to be to count the, the, to count the, to carry the, to carry the boards and to carry all the things. And we got to say to ourselves, you're talking about month old babies. Like they're in charge of guarding the Mishkan. Like the 20 year olds are going to war, but the month old, they're the ones who are going to carry the curtains and carry it. And they're in charge of the, you know, the, the, the legacy of God. Uh, is the oldest. Well, correct. Yes, correct. Is gonna be, but it's an interesting kind of juxtaposition into the conversation. And one of the things that the Chacham talk about, and, and really the Bali Musa kind of highlight this, is that we have two types of worth. That maybe doesn't sound very good, but we basically have, let, let's run with it. And if, if I come up with a better word, I'll, share, I'll change it. We basically, there's two ways that we count. We count just because of who we are. And the count of the 20 year olds has nothing to do with what their job is gonna be. It's, 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 it's nothing to do with whatever, it has nothing to do with what they actually are. But the count of the, of the month, the, as I say, the month year olds, but that's not, that's not actually a real word, right? But the, but the count of the month is saying, what is our potential? That even though these are babies, they're only a month old and they are not going to be standing guard. But the immediate juxtaposition to say, we're going to count the month old babies is to say that they're going to guard the Mishkan Hashem. That means we have infinite potential. And when we actualize our infinite potential in how, whatever finite ways we actualize it, that's a different kind 
of count. I don't want to say worth because that's like a loaded kind of word. Counting potential. Yeah, but 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 no, but not only that. It's not just counting our potential. It's reminding us two things. A, we we count. We are we we count no matter what we do or we don't do. But we also count when we do. And there's a place where, when we do work on actualizing our potential, it's a very good thing. It's not it, meaning we don't not count if we don't do anything. Does that make sense in English? Right? Meaning whatever it's by so existing. Wild. It's like we, we just by existing, we count, but we can add value to our count maybe by actually actualizing our, our potential. Okay. And I think that's something I thought was very beautiful and I wanted to I wanted to share it. Okay. Maybe it's maybe instead of saying work, like you can do worthiness oh good one i like that like their worthiness yeah. mm -hmm. zoe i'm taking your edit okay thank you okay then the next thing that we're going to have is a conversation that hashem is taking the levites in service in place of the firstborns and so we're going to have a conversation of um it's going to start over here in chapter 3 verse 44 and 45 that we're going to exchange a Levite for a Israelite firstborn. Okay, the is the firstborns were supposed to work in the Mishkan. They lost their opportunity when they sinned with the golden calf. They're taking over, and it's hope. Yes. Correct, but yes, but the the quest. You know, it's interesting. There's a there's a conversation. That a Kohen, you don't, you can't lose your co. You're always a Kohen, but if you, in the halacha, is that if a Kohen serves another god, they lose their right to serve in the temple. I mean, they're not not a Kohen, but they can't do the service if they pledged allegiance to another idol, another deity, another whatever. You can't just say, "Oh, that didn't work out. I'll go back to my day job." Okay, and so what happens is that originally in Plan A. Every single family, the firstborn was supposed to represent the family and work in the temple. That was the firstborn. That was the first plan. Some religions still have that idea that the firstborn, you know, goes in the house of God and blah, blah, blah. Okay. That was the first, the, the plan. But then once they served the golden calf, they lost their ability to be the servants of Hashem. That makes sense. I just I realized there was a connection between the firstborn and well, they were part of the people who served the golden calf. Uh, correct, but as a as a but as, as, as a class, as the representing, yeah, representing yeah, yeah. the firstborn, we the it's not people. it's not the individual you firstborn, you firstborn, we the but the firstborns, people. the firstborns lost their ability to serve in the base Hamikdash, and the Levites were going to take over that situation, and they had at that point a, a, a an exact switcheroo. There was there were uh, the Torah is going to count. I think twenty three thousand. Uh, and a small number afterwards. I, do, I don't know who has their English over there is going to find. 2, so 273, 20, 273, uh, uh, okay, so there's 22,273 firstborns. Now, 273 of those firstborns are also Levites, right? So basically, what happens is I'm a Levite. This is a firstborn. You're supposed to work in the house of God. So now I'm going to work in the house of God instead. So we're going to do a switcheroo. We're going to go one. But the Levites, who were firstborns, switched themselves out. Okay. So they stayed Levites because their Levite hat. They lost because their firstborn happened. So now we have 273 who no longer have a Levite to switch out with. And so they had to pay money. And Moshe made a lottery. And because everybody said, oh, yeah, I got switched out with the Levite. So everybody picked the lottery. They either were switched out or they had to pay five shekels to redeem themselves which we know today as a mitzvah of Hidina ben redeeming the firstborn son uh where we essentially say to the, the the parents we say do you want your firstborn child or do you want your money um which is a kind of interesting way to and if you've ever been in a pity ben the coin always says you know like sure are you sure like every every coin thinks it's like an original fun joke it's whatever <laughs> um <laughs> right, they were like, "You sure you want to get? You're gonna think about this, you know?" Um, and and parenthetically, like a parenthesis to the parentheses, it's a very interesting question that we need to ask ourselves on a regular basis, because in a, such a situation where 
the Kohen is literally holding your 30 day old child and saying, do you want this child or do you want your money? We're like, give me the kid, right? But in our lives, do we live a life that reflects that truth? My children or money, how am I, am I spending time with my children as they got a little bit bigger? And as I got more, you know, I needed to still be their parent or was I so busy with my job and with my money that I neglected the children and I told the call, no, for sure, for sure, for sure, give me the, give me the kid. Like, you know, so I think it's like, it's, it's, a, it's cute to look at, but as a, as a, how do we look at it long-term? It's, it's, a, it's an important question. Um, that was the only time that it was a one-for-one -one switch. That it was person for person, that it was a switch out. Today, one Kohen could do, could do a pigeon event for many children. And the animals, we had to switch out the firstborn animals also given to the Kohanim. And you could redeem many animals on one animal. So it was only that period of time, which is interesting that the Torah goes into detail about it, that we have the space of a one-time event of switching out. And, and what does it mean? Bigger term? I don't have the, the total answer. Okay. Yes, we do. So I thought the deal was that the Levites were already going to be serving in just like because they were from that tribe, they were already going to be serving. But this sounds like you're switching out for the firstborn. So it was originally supposed to be the firstborn. Correct. But then the Levites got it not because of who they were, but like as a default. Like the Right. So, right. Right. Else, which is different than being chosen to do it. Right. First. Well, so it's interesting because in, in life, how we have the, the interplay of layers of history, right? If we look at the blessings that Jacob gives his children, he says to he says to Levi, to my 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 the koh the kohenness, whatever that's not a real word. You got the kohen. But then that's not actually how it but then how it has to play out until they actually earn it becomes more complicated because there was a place that was also given to the first points. Now, one could argue, Hashem knew that the first ones were going to lose it, and therefore he had to stand, you know, he had his stand in ready. But it doesn't seem to be, there seems to be like there's a place where they're kind of both equally could have done it, but then one lost the one lost their ability. And in the, in the beginning of the time in the desert, we do have a place where the firstborns were serving as the Kohanim. It's, it, it's like a, you, you, there's a place where Moshe has, calls them and, it, and it's very clear that it's not the Levite, it's the firstborns who are doing the service once. But then they, they did lose their ability to do it. So, and yet, you know, we have that, that Yaakov told Levi, you don't carry my, what's the real word for cast? A beer, a beer, B-I-E-R, fire, I don't know, whatever. It's a real word. I think it's a B-I-E-R, but I'm... No, 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 like not the casket. There's another word for it, whatever. But Yaakov says to, to Levi, don't, you can't do this because you're going to work for God. That's clearly before. So there's like layers of how, how it worked out. I don't know exactly, you know, how, how well, you know, maybe we're just talking different levels, you know, Pshat versus Medrash could be. I don't really know. Also, um, why weren't they working in Egypt? I mean, it was part of their so, status, right? So, right. so they, they were. Status. No, no. So they weren't working in Egypt because of, because of slavery in Egypt started as a, as a goodwill campaign. How did, it, how did Pharaoh suddenly get all the Jews enslaved? He's like, we're going to build the country. We're going to beautify the country. Everybody come, let's do it. And so all the Jews came to do it, except for the tribe of Levi. They're like, we're learning Torah. It's okay. We don't need to be part of your building campaign. And the Egyptians were part of it. And that's what the measure says. Like it was the Egyptians and the Jews who were doing this. And slowly the Egyptians pulled out and then the Jews were left enslaved. And because the tribe, of, the tribe of Levi never stepped up to the plate to be part of this campaign, they were left learning Torah the whole time. And in the sense, they're showing Why? us- Why? Why were they learning Torah the whole time? Because they- Because they knew that they were going to- No, no, because I, this is an I think. It's based on what I learned, but I can't give you chapter and verse of where, where it would make sense. There were two ways we could have done Egypt. We could have done Egypt like the Levites did Egypt. And we could have done Egypt like the Jews ended up doing Egypt. And it was a choice. It was a choice. The media, maybe it wasn't such a conscious level choice. But our, that, that, you know, that having to toil in Torah could have counted as toiling in a strange land. And the tribe of Lady actually actualized that. And they did it that way. And the rest of the Jewish people said, we need to be like the people around us. 
We need to blend into the culture. We need to be, we need to make sure they like us. We need to be, right? Does this sound like very familiar pop? You know, we've heard these, these conversations over. This is a conversation that plays itself out through history. But there are many ways that we can do this and how we choose to set our path is how our path is gonna look. So had more people decided, you know what? We're gonna sit and learn Torah. Like that's really what we wanna do. We're not gonna be concerned about do the, does the government like us? And how, like, we're gonna do our thing and you do your thing, you know, like, and it's fine. Had more people joined, would the whole Egypt situation have been different? Yeah, but here we are it, and it wasn't, you know what I mean? So like, that's kind of where we are right now. But the, the tribe of Levi proves to us that there was another way to do slavery. And even today, we have that ability to say, how, how involved are we? How much do we want to be part of the culture around us? And where do we, you know, where do we play those pieces together? And that's always going to be our choice, even though we sometimes feel like it isn't our choice. Um, the Seder, the last thing that's going to go on here, and we're really, I'm, going to, I'm not going to go into it because we'll pick it up. We start talking about the individual family of Kahas and their specific job in the Mishkan and what they did. They... The, the, the cliff notes is that they carried all the holy objects and we're going to pick it up again next week when we start dealing with the Parsha there because I want to finish off and I don't, I want you guys to have a break. This whole counting situation is like an interesting thing. So Rashi says Hashem counts us because he loves us and da 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 and that's, you know, we do that. So I want to raise two questions. If it's a question of Hashem loving us, like does he only love half the population? Like, really above 20 males, males above 20 who are going to go fight in the wars. Like, like, is that one thing? So, so to, to sort of like unknot it a little bit, I want to say two things. First of all, um, and I, 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 okay, first of all, the first people who were counted in a shot level were the people who were going to go to war and they needed to have the extra protection because they were going out to war. They needed to be, we have this conversation that the, the soldiers of the, of the camp of, da, of, of David, like Chayola based David, they were counted individually and that was a protection for them that they could go to war and come back safely, okay? So in a spiritual sense, we have two models of how we interact with the world. One of them is a male or a masculine, not specific, not male versus female, but a masculine modality of going out and fighting whatever's around us, fighting the darkness, fighting the forces of evil. That is a masculine modality. We all use part of it, okay? We don't, we don't only do feminine, which is nurturing and, and, and more internal. But when we, in, when we engage the masculine way of engaging with the world, of going to war with the world and saying, we're fighting the wars for God, we need an extra protection. It's much easier to hold on to your core values when you deal with your feminine part. Your feminine part, which is nurturing and more internal and less engaged with the world, I could stay true to my values on a much easier manner because I'm not threatened by the world. But when I engage the world, as all of us need to do and all of us do on a regular basis, we need to know that we need an extra level of protection when we do that. And we need to know that there is a place that we are counted and that we are, we are. So the, the way it works in the Torah is that the men who went to war were counted, but it's a lesson for us as well, that when our masculine part of engaging with the world, even when we do it in a feminine fashion, but when we engage the world, that's war. And we have to understand that that is what we're at. It's not just like tra-la-la, you know, like it's not necessarily like a bloody conquest, but like we can't when we deal with the world, we have to sort of look at it in a term of there's going to be one winner and one loser. It's not just like, let's all compromise and play nicely and whatever. And when we engage that part of our life, we have to know that we need extra, we need extra protection. And what is the protection that counting gives us? So in two different sikhs, the Rebbe talks about the idea that something that is counted is not, is not nullified. We all know that in Kashrus, there is the idea of Batal Bashishim. Something could be nullified one in 60, one in the majority, one in 100. There's all different kinds of proportions of how things get nullified, right? Um, and one of the things, in ha- one of the halachic principles is that Dover Shabiminion ain't in his battle. Something that is counted is never nullified. When we uh, Something, the more important something is, the 
the more specifically we count it. You could buy a pound of something, but you could buy something by the piece. Something by the piece is it's showing you that it has more importance than something you just buy. Like I'll take a box of apples. Nobody's saying there's how many how many apples are in the box. I don't know. I'm buying a box of apples. Whatever it is is what it is. Sometimes I'm buying a pound of something. Sometimes I'm buying a dozen eggs. Right, a dozen eggs means I counted. Eggs are sold by the piece. Diamonds are not only sold by the piece, but they're sold by the very specific kind of piece. But like there's so many very right, there's so many variables to each specific diamond. It's not just oh, let's pay 12 eggs. We're not just putting 12 diamonds in a package and saying, you know, you know, this is a sale on diamonds today, right? Um, in, in halacha, for example, an item that is you want to talk about can it be nullified? The first question we want to ask is how is it counted? How do we deal with it? So, for example, eggs become a problem if you now I don't know where we would get non-kosher eggs today. I don't know if they sell non-kosher eggs commercially. Okay, but if one of your non-kosher eggs got mixed into your food, because eggs are sold as pieces, they're never nullified. They don't get nullified in your food. If you had one kosher egg in your omelet with six kosher eggs, you can't say, well, the majority of them are kosher because eggs are sold as individuals. No, because it's because Dover Shibaminion ain't in a spot though. Something that is counted is never nullified. The same thing is something that is very important, something that is integral to your recipe, let's say. You can't just, you can't say like, oh, there's only a little bit of gelatin proportionate to everything, but because the dish isn't what it is without that bit, it doesn't, you can't just nullify it, okay? So what, so what does that mean for us? That we, the Jewish people, it's so easy. It, and people have said this to us throughout our history. You're so little, just join the majority, just be part of society, just leave your individualism alone and kind of blend. And we say to the world and we tell ourselves, we are Dovrish of a minion. We are something that is counted. And if we count, we can never be nullified. It doesn't matter if there's one Jew in a city of 100,000 or we're as many Jews as we are in a world of how many millions and billions and trillions, well, not trillions, but whatever, right? <laughs> Okay, so I exaggerate a little bit. We don't get nullified because we are something that's counted. And because we have that in our DNA, we are counted. Therefore, we are never nullified. And we never say, we're going to just blend in with everybody else and it's not going to make a difference. So I want to give us all a bracha. We're opening up a new book. We're opening up the book of Bamidbar. It's the book that tells us we count as an individual, whether we do anything or not, but also if we do something. So I want to give us a bracha that we wear our count with pride and that we know that when we engage with the world as we are going to and we have to that we do it with a place of understanding that we're coming from a from a secure place we're not coming from a you know we're coming from a place of confidence and from a place of security and that we should be successful as we work to make this world a better place have an awesome rest of the day